So let's make a start for this uh, afternoon session. <clears throat> so to open the uh, the session, we have uh, Nicholas Cantas, who's currently Associate Professor slash Senior Lecturer at Imperial College London in Statistics. Uh, Nick uh, did his PhD at the University of Cambridge, uh, followed by postdoctoral stints at the uh, University of Cambridge and uh, Imperial College London, as well as University College London. And uh, he's going to give a talk on joint online parameter estimation and sensor placement for continuous time state space models. Please take it away, Nick, and thank you for agreeing to give a talk. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation and apologies for, for not being able to, to make it in person. Um, so, so this is joint work with, with a former PhD student, uh, Louis Sharrock, who is now a senior research fellow in Lancaster. And maybe let's go to the kind of introduction and, and some motivating remarks of what follows. Um, so, so the talk is an overview of a couple of papers that uh, we did with Lewis when he was doing his PhD. And the motivation came from, from uh, our also sponsors, who, who is National Physical Laboratory, and perhaps it is worth to, to acknowledge some, some very useful discussion with uh, a uh, senior research scientist there, uh, Alistair Forbes, and also Dan Christian, who is also a professor here at Imperial. Now, what we're interested on a high level is to do some kind of environmental monitoring. And, and here I'm drawing a map of London, right? And, and somehow some gridded uh, rectangle. And what happens is there are some stations uh, scattered around London, and there are different dots there, red and blue dots that measure different pollutants and, and different things to assess air quality, right? And here I have some maybe not very uh, nice quality pictures, but some pictures on how things, things look like. And there are plans now also to have mobile sensors that are mounted on cars, buses, and so on. So there's a natural question on where to put place them if they are immobile or which routes should they follow, okay? So, so this is the, the kind of um, motivation. So, so I'm having here some quantity that I'm calling uh, V, and chi here is meant to be the x, y plane, right? And t is time. So somehow this is a pollutant. There's some scalar field that varies in space and time across this 2D region we're interested in London. And it could be some air pollutant, but you could think of similar example also with water pollution and sea pollution and so on. So, so. Um, and what we have is we have these stations that are mobile or, or, or sort of a fixed positions, and they do some no they, they measure some some noisy observations of these quantities. And what we would like to know is we would like to know what is the concentration of uh, these pollutants given some kind of observations, right? So, so this is if you want the standard filtering problem, and. Uh, we want to, to do some kind of nice inference procedure. So there are three natural steps here. The first one is to, to choose a model, right, for, for V. Uh, so we need to, to choose some kind of model. And this model will depend on some constants or static parameters or model parameters. Call them uh, as you wish. And we will denote them here with uh, the Greek letter theta. And of course, the first step is to fit your model to your data, right? And this is the same thing as saying, what are to find what are these parameters theta uh, as explained by the data you've collected from the census, right? But at the same time, we have an objection that we're interested in tracking this pollutant and you have some control over the model. So we could optimize the sensors and move them to better positions. And this could also be something that you do online if they're you know, mounted on cars that can follow different routes around the city and so on, all right, or drones or, or things like that. So, so, so somehow at the same time, we want to optimize if you want uh, the sensor locations. And what is this talk about is to discuss how we could do, if you want this task, the model fitting and the sensor uh, placement optimally uh, jointly, right? And also online. So, so, so the model we will use here for new will be state space models and we'll consider continuous time state space model, which I'm writing now. So, so now this V 
right? We will we, we'll call now X, and sorry about this, this is somehow kind of more standard notation, but this is if you want the hidden signal that will follow some kind of stochastic differential equation. V here is some Brownian noise, and there are some kind of diffusion and drift uh, vectors and matrices that will depend on theta. This is if you want the hidden quantity, and Y will denote the observation. It will be some stochastic differential equation with some sensor function C that depends on theta, the actual hidden quantity that we're trying to measure, and also this bold O, which here will denote the, the sensor position, if you want O for observer, and some additive notes. So, so this is the model we would like to calibrate, and on top of that, we have this uh, kind of uh, bold O that we would like uh, to control over. All right, so, so this is, if you want, the, the introduction, and, and, and here's what, what follows. So we will discuss first how to do separately online parameter estimation, separately online sensor placement. And when we do this in isolation, for example, when we do parameter estimation for known sensor positions or sensor placement for, for known parameters, and then we'll try to put these things together and say how we could do these things at the same time, right? And we'll start with thinking about state space models uh, but then eventually what this will happen is this will be phrased as some kind of bi-level optimization problem with two criteria that we're interested in optimizing and one depending on the other. Um, so, so then we will use some kind of online gradient procedure here and then we would like to, to assess its convergence and try to show uh, that this thing converges and have a kind of slightly more general result from which we will base this conclusion and discuss how this is derived. Um, and then towards the end, there will be some kind of um, numerical exams and discussions. All right, so, so this is a slide for, for, for people that are not familiar with filtering. So we have, a, if you remember, state space model, there's a hidden SDE, right? And there is also a kind of, uh, which is uh, called, uh, with a hidden state being XT. There's a sequence of observations that we have stacked together in this uh, calligraphical Y, so, so this continuous data stream there. And what we're interested to learn is if you want the, the distribution of XD given all the data and this also conditional fixed uh, parameter theta and sensor positions O. All right, and you can apply Bayes rule. So, so this is what is written here in a kind of more uh, fancy way. And what you see here is if you want uh, inside row some kind of design of density with respect to the actual uh, observation equation. So, so this would be something similar to, to your likelihood function. And then this is if you want the, the normalizing constant row. All right. Now, this kind of filter can be written in different ways, right? And sometimes you might see this as pi t of some test function phi that characterizes the distribution. Uh, you could read, see it as a conditional expectation. Uh, we, we'll use a slightly, if you want, compact form here. And often when we use a conditional expectation of some test function phi, we'll put some hat. So whenever you see a hat on top of, of some uh, letter, it will denote a conditional expectation with respect to all the observations up to that time, right? And these kind of uh, filters can have some nice evolutions that you can write and, and study in more detail. Uh, I think the only point worth saying about this, and I don't want to comment further, is that in this talk, we'll focus on, on filters where this kind of continuous evolution of the filtering distribution or its density will depend on, on some known quantities and we'll have what people call like finite or closed filters where, where you actually can evaluate, you can evolve this analytically and you know uh, sufficient statistics to, to calculate these quantities like the Kalman filter or, or Venice filter, or even some kind of ensemble Kalman filter. So, so these are the class of filters we will look at later, and we'll come back to this point. All right, so one thing we're saying here is that given this is some form of Bayes rule, this denominator here can be also viewed as some kind of marginal log likelihood. 
uh, some kind of marginal likelihood, and, and somehow you could think of this as some some quantity, some nice, if you want, objective that you could try to maximize to to find a, a nice estimate for theta for the unknown parameters, right? And in fact, we do what is common in statistics: take its log transform, and after some calculations, this can also be written as some kind of uh, functional well you have here if you want the conditional expectation with respect to all the data of the observation function and, and, and some squared here term and also you, you integrate with the observation. So, so this is something and suppose that these quantities are all known here which in general is a little bit uh, if you want uh, interactable but let's su suppose this can happen and um, somehow you could consider this quantity and try to if, the, if t was fixed, you would try to optimize this, maximize this, and, and get the, the maximizer to be an estimate for theta and fit your model to data. All right, now, if you're interested to do this online, one approach could be to look at a long time uh, objective function, right? And what you could do is you could take one over t and do a time average of, of this marginal log likelihood and take t to be large. And if there are some nice ergodicity properties for, for y, x, the filter, this thing will converge to, to some sort of expectation of something. And then you could say, all right, I might be able, instead of actually trying to take a gradient of this guy here, to do some kind of stochastic gradient descent type of operation and, and think of doing something that could be thought as a kind of estimator of this. All right, and this is roughly equivalent, and I'm being completely loose uh, mathematically here, of formally taking gradients inside uh, the, the integrands here. All right, and, and what if you do this, what you will end up with is a continuous, if you want, evolution for theta, where I'm having here some kind of learning rate or step size, and then I'm formally taking gradients with theta here, and always evaluating these formal gradients with theta t. Okay, so I have some kind of gradient of, if you want, the expectation of c given the data, and then this is multiplied by y, and then the same thing here, which is just the, the expected c given the data. Right, so, so somehow this is a continuous, if you want, evolution that somehow we hope that this thing will converge to if you want the the, the kind of uh, maximizer of, of this guy, right? And I think here somehow there is a there is a typo here. This should be maximized, right? Okay, so so this is one approach we'll consider on on trying to estimating theta. So now let's pretend. And so far we've at least for this size pretended that that the observer is fixed. Now let's pretend that theta is fixed, and we want to learn the observer. So if theta is fixed and we know the actual filter, right? This is if you want the distribution of xt given all the y's. One thing we could say is we would like to actually try to minimize the uncertainty of, of our estimators of the pollutants. So somehow we could work directly with something that depends on the covariance of this quantity. Okay, for example, we could look at some kind of trace to minimize the trace of this covariance or some other scalar but that is derived from it, and that is appropriate. And this is, there are many ideas along this line and it is common with what people have been doing for a long time in experimental design. Um, all right, now, if I go back to, to linear Gaussian state space models, this quantity has some kind of evolution like similar to, to what we saw before for the filter that's called the Riccati equation. And it has been studied for a long time how to control the Riccati equation. And, and somehow this is the purpose here. So we would like to actually control for, for having a nice covariance uh, matrix based on how we place our observers. Now, this has been recently, or maybe not so recently anymore, uh, pushed further, even in the cases where X, T lives in some Hilbert space and, and I think our approaches will resemble later on recent work by Burns and Carlos Rautenberg or Zach and, and Kirsten Morris. So, so somehow these are tools that will build up later on, at least for the examples uh, towards the end. 
Okay, so, so we'll try to do something um, similar to before. Here things are fair deterministic already, so, so it's a little bit uh, easier. So we have, we, we could come up with a nice cost function that um, would be some sort of long time average or perhaps some kind of other uh, quantity that has some kind of asymptotic meaning. Right, so just for the sake of the example here, we could think of the integral of the trace of, of the filter covariance uh, and then average it in time. Now for, for this, I've added here some kind of matrix H of S and, and somehow this is completely designers if you want uh, addition, it, it's nothing is, for example, if X is high dimensional, for example, in the environmental monitoring example, if you're interested only in very specific areas, you want to monitor pollution, let's say schools, busy roads or, or things like that, you could perhaps use this to isolate specific states you really care about and, and, and embed this in your optimization on, on where to place the sensor, right? And for us, this was also useful to actually construct nice synthetic case studies where we know where the observer should go if we're interested for particular states, right? So it could be that this is the identity, but somehow it could allow you to be more selective on what you're interested in. And then following the same idea as we said before, we'll have some kind of nice asymptotic uh, criterion to kind of uh, uh, minimize in this case. So we could end up with an online uh, gradient similar to before. And here, if you want uh, J hat is what we will call to be, if you want the integrand in here that the, the gradient for O will follow. Okay. All right. And one thing to notice here is that somehow if I let this evolve, the solution will depend on theta. All right, so the parameters are, are, are fitted. And for now, we're assuming this is uh, fixed. Okay, so, so now we'll try to, to put these things together and formulate a bi-level optimization. We'll try to solve uh, using these two uh, gradient approaches. Uh, so, so at first, we would like to maximize the log likelihood or minimize minus the log likelihood. And one thing to say here is that Somehow, this will depend on the observer's position. And as I've just said, the observer's position could be optimized and the optimizer will depend on theta itself, right? So, so somehow let's pretend theta is known. We could uh, minimize this cost function J we, we've just uh, uh, mentioned before based on the covariance matrix. This will depend on both theta and O, and we'll get an optimizer that depends on theta. So O star of theta could then be plugged in inside the likelihood uh, maximization. All right, this is the most uh, general, if you want, uh, bi-level optimization uh, formulation. Now here I'm picking as the parameter estimation to be a kind of primary criterion and the sensor placement uh, secondary, working on a, a lower level, you could do it the other way around. Okay, it's just this was our, our preference here. Okay, now, this is a slightly hard problem to solve. And from what I've said, it's clear we're going to use gradient, so, so we'll focus on a much weaker problem. Essentially, what we'll be saying is, all right, let's try to look a more local version of this problem, where I'm looking to, to actually optimize theta for some value of O, and similarly O for some value of theta, and I'm hoping that I will be able to match these two things together. And what this would mean is I would like to find some nice stationary points for the two gradients that also correspond to some local minimizer. All right, so, so this is, if you want a weaker problem to, to solve, and then you could, think of whether this method is applicable to, to the more general bi-level optimization problem by doing some um, changes or adding some assumptions on J uh, tilde and L tilde. So I should have said, so L tilde and J tilde are these asymptotic criteria that said. All right, then for the state space model, what I'm writing here is the two equations uh, I've presented earlier uh, together. And what we're interested in establishing here is that if we follow these uh, equations, 
Um, then in the long run, what will happen is theta t and o t will, will reach these stationary points of these two gradients. So it will reach the zero points of these uh, gradients. Okay, and this, of course, here requires a propagation of some gradients. Now notice these hats here and here it means that we need to propagate at the same time with theta and O the filter itself, right? Or sufficient statistics that give you the filter, like the mean and covariance for the Kalman filter, for example. And in addition, it's theta and O gradients, right? So that we will be able to, to calculate these steps. But if this is possible, then this equation here is implementable. Okay, and there will be some additional approximations for this discretizing time and so on, but in principle, it is implemented. All right, now, now if we want to, to, to establish and, and say more things, right, so, so it's a, a short discussion and going back to, to sort of whether we can assess moving from this problem to, to the more general one. Uh, one option is to, to, to think of, if you want adding more um, kind of restrictions, for example, it could be if you can establish some very strong assumption on L and J tilde that there's only one point that is a global solution, then this is uh, something that if you want can be done, right? But it, it will mean that you will pose a lot of restrictions. Um, while we were, we were actually finishing the paper, we came across an approach that could be done to do this nesting <laughs> in a local manner. And somehow the issue here is that when you take gradients in, in our approach that I've just discussed that is implementable, um, somehow we don't work in any gradients with respect to this function that gives you the maximizer with respect to theta. And this map is, is crucial uh, for what we're doing. Now, there, there are some ideas that you could actually replace the gradient for the, the, the log likelihood with some surrogate gradient that implicitly takes care of this term. And I'm writing the expression here. So, so what you could do is if you add some sort of a, assumptions on, on the Hessian of, of uh, the second criterion and, and some more, you could also establish that these stationary points that this um, evolution will convert to will also correspond to a minimization problem like this. So the kind of bi-level optimization we started with. Okay, but this is more just uh, uh, in terms of background. Okay, so so what, what do we want to do is we have here some kind of two criteria, right? And I will start with a simple problem that is more generic that I'm trying to solve and try to establish that these two time scale uh, gradient algorithms are sensible to reach these uh, these stationary points. So, so what we want to, to show is that somehow, suppose we want to solve this equation here, grad A F is equal to zero and grad beta G is equal to zero. If I implement these gradients here, so I take the gradient of F, the gradient of beta and add some uh, continuous noise, uh, that this thing will convert to, to, to the correct stationary point. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually use some uh, old ideas by Borkar and in addition, so, some kind of uh, ideas from, from Benheim's work on, on stochastic approximation. We'll put these together and try to formulate them on how they would work for, for this problem. Um, so, so so, so there are some assumptions, right? So there are some assumptions of the step size that they need to go to zero. And one thing to say, perhaps if apologies for the sign flicking is that the way we've nested the problem, you might think of theta evolving on a slow scale and O evolving on a faster scale. So we would like this guy to be much faster and go much quicker, uh, to zero, right? So, so this is the same thing here we're trying to do. It's just that this is our theta now, and this is our O. It's just that we've changed the letter just to express a more different and more general results. And these are, are captured here. Would like to have some nice properties for the gradients. Now this stochastic approximation, and there's a famous condition called Kushner-Clark, and there are other equivalent ones. What this says is that somehow the noise will not be able in the long run to dominate uh, the step sizes and, 
and, and somehow the, the kind of evolutions become a little bit uncontrollable. Okay, we'd like uh, alpha and beta to be bounded. And I mean, this is a gradient algorithm here. It's not exactly the same problem I, I, I mentioned before for the state space model, but eventually we'll get there. But you're just taking these gradients and adding some noises and two, and two learning grades here. So, so, so somehow you would like at least the ODEs of these points to have some nice uh, equilibrium. So, so what happens is you have, if you want the fast scale here that runs and, and, and tries to, to target an OD like this one, and you have the slow scale that has its own ID that has A and is input if you want the, the, the stationary points or, or the, the equilibrium points of this equation, you'd like this to be nice equilibrium. Now, for the purpose of the talk, um, I don't think there's much point to say more details. One thing you could think about is to have, if you want, cases that beta, this equation has some nice isolated discrete equilibria. Uh, beta I star would characterize this equilibrium. This would be a nice map. And also that this equation also uh, would have, if you want, also discrete equilibria that are not connected to form limit cycles or any other pathological uh, behavior, right? So, so I mean, of course, you could always strengthen the assumptions and, and you know, aim for something more global, like um, kind of having a unique uh, equilibrium points in both cases, but these are very strong assumptions somehow uh, that are not necessary if you're interested for some kind of more local yeah. optimization. All right, so, so how does this work? So we take these um, noise equations and what we do is we apply an appropriate time shift according to, to the step sizes we've used. And what we do is first we consider the fast time scale and try to show that it will track in some sense uh, this equation. And then we repeat, for, for, we do this first for the fast time scale and then we repeat this uh, for the slow time scale. And, and what we're trying to do here is we're trying to to, to kind of show that the stochastic gradient algorithm, uh, after being after being through a kind of a, a time transform that depends on the step size, will track an equation where um, the the slowest time scale essentially is fixed and doesn't move. So so if you initialize the the, the top time scale uh, to its value and keep it fixed. Somehow then this will track uh, the, the, the kind of ODE uh, that is implied here with A fixed. Now what tracking means here is based on these asymptotic pseudo trajectories of Ben Aim, what this means is that for very long times, the two dynamical systems after a very long time will be close at an arbitrary accuracy and also for an arbitrary long time. This is the kind of meaning. And once uh, this is established, you can actually show that eventually these dynamics will converge to, if you want, uh, the fixed state that you've started with and the critical points, uh, the, the equilibrium points from, from, from the fast time scale. And then essentially what you do is you repeat the same thing and you show that the, the actual um, Stochastic dynamics are an asymptotic pseudo trajectory for the uh, for the OD corresponding to the fast time scale, and then you get the result. So, so, so it, it sounds um, fairly complicated, but somehow is is a kind of a two time scale OD type method for for the uh, stochastic approximation. Usually, these are phrased in discrete time uh, problems, but it's the, the similar analog in continuous time. So, so in some sense, it's a low-hanging fruit, right? There, there isn't a lot of new ideas here. It's just deriving them in a way that is sensible to, to our problem. All right, so, so now I'll move on to the more interesting case that will be more applicable for what we're doing with the, the state space models. I will take, I will still have a fast, a slow time scale on the top and a fast time scale in the bottom. And instead of here having grad F and grad G, I will add here some capital letters F and G. 
which would be some sort of unbiased estimators. All right, and what does this mean is somehow there is some kind of noise here inside the capital F and capital G, which I write with this curly X. This noise will follow a stochastic differential equation with some round, driven by some Brownian motion. So there's a kind of continuous Markovian noise. And this X tilde here will be assumed to be ergodic with uh, an invariant distribution. Here. So what we're saying here is that let's consider these Markovian dynamics. Suppose we have this function capital F and the integral of F with the invariant distribution will give you grad F that we're working before in the simple case. And the same thing for the fast uh, time scale. So, so these are, are, are the dynamics. So, so what we'll try to do is try to, to repeat the same kind of uh, result and say that in these cases, both alpha and beta here will converge to the stationary points where grad F and grad G are zero. All right, so, so we need to, to add some more assumptions here. One is natural that somehow uh, X is ergodic and we also want some kind of nice uh, moment bounds for the gradients as well. Okay, there are some, some kind of uh, technical conditions for, for the step sizes. Uh, one tool that we'll be using a lot is the Poisson equation here that will provide some controls I will talk a little bit about later on. So, so if this is the generator of the Markovian dynamics that we've just mentioned, somehow would like the Poisson equation to have some nice properties like uh, being continuous, having polynomial growth with X and, and some kind of nice derivative. Or I would like also some kind of nice properties for, for the dynamics of the Markovia noise and also some, some, some structure more on what this kind of additive noise can be. And, and somehow we, this should also be some kind of SDE with some here uh, predictable process and, and here some kind of uh, VNR process, right? So, so, so all this um, can be, if you want uh, work together. And the main idea we're trying to do here is to, to write the, the evolution we had before in a form where we decompose it to a true uh, gradient descent, fluctuations and noise, all right? So, so in both cases, what you would have is the dynamics that were written with the Markovian noise, you would have some term which would be the true descent terms. The fluctuations, between the, the, the estimator of the gradient with the Markovian noise and the actual uh, true gradient and, and some kind of additional noise term here. And, and same for, for, for the fast time scale. Um, and essentially to, to actually establish that we will get the same results and, and these two guys will converge to the stationary points of the two uh, gradients. Um, what we would need is to show that actually the size, these kind of elements here behave like in the previous case. So this is if you want the, how, how the proof is structured. And the main uh, tool here to control this uh, fluctuation is to use the Poisson equation. And this is why we had some assumptions um, on that. So, so it's worth saying a few things about this because we're using a lot ideas for, for continuous time um, stochastic approximation. The, the, the works that are closer to us is the works by Surace and, and oops, what is this, sorry. The works by okay, Surace and Fister and also uh, the works by Sirignano and Spiliopoulos. Uh, so, so what happens is Surace and Fister had algorithm for state space model that just did the parameter estimation continuously. Uh, and they built this upon a, a kind of uh, approach that was taken uh, by Sirignano and Spiliopoulos building up some earlier work, uh, some older work, sorry. Um, now our, our proof is, is, is different, but we use the same controls. So, so we use, if you want, a kind of more OD method and Burkhardt's idea for this and not exactly these approaches here. We tried actually initially to adapt their approaches for the two time scale a case, but but didn't manage to do it. But we also share if you want the same controls that are are, are given by the Poisson. 
All right, so, so we managed to get the result we want. So how do we apply this for stage-based models to, to make this a little bit more useful? Uh, all right, so, so suppose I can, if you want to evaluate the filter and the evolution I showed in the beginning, um, by having, if you want some noisy sufficient statistics that evolve via some stochastic differential equation that depends if you want on some drift, uh, the noise, another function here, and, and some other noise. So if I have some SDE like this that can give me these M's, can let me evaluate the filter analytically, then what we're going to do is we're kind of going to stack, if you want, the sufficient statistics of the filter uh, together in, in this curly X Markovian noise, as I called it before together with gradients with respect to theta and all, right? And this vec means some kind of vectorization kind of operator. So just to have an example here with the Kalman filter and what this means, somehow would like to have, if you want, uh, the mean, the covariance, and some gradients with respect to theta and all of these quantities. And also uh, the, the hidden uh, signal itself. So this would give us the kind of X tilde in, in the previous setup. Um, now we would need to run together with M evolutions continuously for the gradients. And th these are very natural. You, you, you propagate them formally by doing some kind of uh, differentiation on, on, the, on, the, on the equation. So, so just as an example to, to see how this will happen with the gradient of theta. So I'm using superscripts here to denote gradients. You would simply need to take a derivative of, of your previous, if you want, uh, drift with respect to theta. And then also um, take, if you want, uh, use at the same time uh, chain rule to, to actually have it both its derivative with respect to theta and with respect to the actual sufficient statistics and then evolve the gradients themselves. So this is how this would work. I realize now that when you look at here, it looks more complicated than it is. But if, if you apply this to, to a Kalman case, it's, it's, it's quite straightforward to, to write uh, the evolution. Um, and there's a little bit of work as well to, to actually show that the implementable Procedure I mentioned at the beginning, that was a little bit like coming from natural, if you want formal uh, differentiation, can be cast in, in, in the framework we use. So, so the, the whole point here is that there is a function that depends on the sufficient statistics here that you could calculate um, this kind of, if you want this kind of C hat and, and J hat uh, functions, right? These are conditional expectations, I'm just saying is a function of psi and, and I, I plug in M and similarly for J hat. And then I use general as I indicated before to, to, to work uh, for the gradients. So, so the point is to go for, from this to something that looked like that uh, based on, on the, the general, more general result. And okay, so, so you, you substitute the terms in there. Uh, the, the trick is to substitute here instead of Y the evolution, this as dx, uh, uh, dx as, 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 as a kind of C dx plus the, the noise in the observation, and then rearrange terms with these substitutions. And this will give you um, the, the kind of expressions you need to characterize f, g, and the, the zeta noise explicitly. All right, and, and this is how this would look for an example uh, for, for the Kalman filter. So, so I don't think there's much going to dwell on about this and, and move straight to the discussion. So, so initially when we came upon this, we were kind of um, limited in terms of what models we could actually um, verify all these conditions. So, so we're quite happy that we could able to at least do it for linear Gaussian models. So, so if ABC functions for the state space model are linear, somehow we can, we can uh, verify these conditions. And, and what we need is 
some kind of exponential stabilizability and observability conditions. So we need a stable filter, stable filter gradients, and, and a well-defined time limit for the covariance, uh, filter covariance, which there are uh, uh, kind of conditions for this. Uh, we're also happy that this worked also for, for space-time models and, 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 and problems where the state could live in some Hilbert space and, and arbitrary dimensions. So, so this is something we did. And also, we, we, we do not have this in the paper, but we, we could also verify some of these conditions for the case of the Benes uh, filter. Uh, all right, and so far I've presented this thinking that I have a filter like the Kalman filter, where you know I can propagate the mean and the covariance um, of the filter and analytically, uh, but actually this idea could actually also work for the ensemble Kalman filter, only it would not be that you're optimizing the ideal log likelihood or the, the, the kind of uh, ideal filter covariance would be the one implied uh, from the ensemble Kalman dynamics. Right, then I will move to, 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 to the example that we we'll try to at least come back to the environmental modeling uh, type application. And this was actually the application we're interested to start with. So, so we, we have this kind of stochastic PD model that we, we saw in Sigrist, Kunz, and Style. Uh, this was a statistics paper that looked at environmental monitoring. And the main focus of that paper was this, was this, was this model that we found in practice to be quite flexible and easy to work with. So it has the advantage that it's linear and Gaussian model, uh, and also that it has enough nice features and enough parameters to be able to tweak it to get nice um, nice uh, fields for the V, which was if you want the pollutants concentration or some other environmental uh, quantity. So what there is a time evolution, there's a linear term, a transport term here, and there's also a diffusion term, which includes also some kind of rotation. And there is a, a noise, which is a, a matern noise here. And the interesting thing about this model is not necessarily these dynamics, but the fact that there are a few parameters, I think there are seven or eight of them, that um, can be used to, to, to shape it uh, nicely. And this will be our, if you want, hidden state coming from, from this uh, dynamics. And we'll also have an observer. So we'll have a bunch of observers that move around um, the phase space here, which is some kind of rectangle or box in, in uh, two dimensions with some periodic um, boundary conditions. And we'll have linear observation at these observers that um, what they do is that if OL is the elf observer, somehow at that location, um, you would take at each time a weighted average of the pollutant around the small ball around the sensor position. So you don't measure exactly one point where the sensor is, you measure a little bit the spatial average around it at each time. So this is your observation uh, one equation. All right, and given the convenient uh, boundary conditions, what we'll try to do is think of the signal as essentially being some, some time evolving Fourier coefficients, K is the, the Fourier index here, and Psi being the, 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 the basis function for different uh, wave numbers. Uh, and we will do also the same for the noise. And the sigma case here will be um, defined by the covariance we just said. And although this seems initially complicated, when you look at this model in the in the Fourier domain, it turns out that the the kind of uh, the, the Fourier coefficients are simply a scalar OU process that completely diagonalizes with k, which is very convenient is a fairly straightforward process to, to, to work with. But I have to say here that the challenge is not necessarily to, to think of the actual model equations, but how to estimate all these psi gammas and rows and uh, this long, li long uh, list of, of constants here. So this is the main point. At the same time, for this a model to, to place nicely uh, the sensor. So, OK, so here's the Kalman filter in, in this case. 
this would be the evolution of the mean, and uh, which is written here. Why is the, the observation? This is the observation function. And PT here is if you want the covariance uh, operator. And there's a nice notion also of a, a kind of Riccati equation uh, for this model, even in the Hilbert space setting. So we need to, to propagate this model and at the same time uh, gradients or tangents with, with theta and O. And this is a very nice model because you, you can sort of establish that somehow you can say under which conditions this thing is exponentially stabilizable or detectable, which means that even if even if this guy is not stable, somehow it's something that you could add some linear feedback and, and make it uh, stable. This is all this is saying for both the um, for, for both the, the dynamics and the, the observations. And if you have a stable Kalman filter, somehow you know that the covariance uh, will converge to some kind of nice asymptotic uh, co covariance um, matrix. So, so this is a model that checks the requirements we posed so that we can implement online dynamics for theta and O uh, before. And here are some pictures to show that this thing actually works. So, so this is a synthetic case study. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing the, the parameters. And the, the red lines are, if you want, the, the, the actual numbers we use to, to generate the scenario. And these are the plots you see. On the right, there are uh, X and Y coordinates for the for different sensors locations. Now, if you remember, there was this matrix H I mentioned about the criterion to select coordinates or areas we're interested in. So we could use this to actually shape this problem so that it forces the sensors to go towards that region. And this is what actually happens here. It's just meant as a proof of concept. And another thing that is worth saying about these online gradients, and this is said both in discrete time and continuous time when they're implemented, is that they are nice to detect also change points. So we have a scenario here where we have the parameters at different time intervals to switch values. So suppose I, I generate my data with some value theta, and then I do it a step change at some time, and change my theta and keep generating data. If you keep the step size fixed and do not have it decreasing, what happens in practice is that these tend to track the, the changes in the parameters. And this is something we also saw here uh, numerically. Here's just an illustration of how different, if you added some sensors and had some fixed and some mobile one, how, how the mobile ones would move to, 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 to actually go to the region that they're, they're, they're asked to do. All right, so this is a, sorry, another plot where we kind of try to compare in some cases what happens if we do not optimize in certain directions. So you might choose just to optimize for theta and not O and to optimize for O but not theta and so on. So, so somehow what this plot says is that you know, the best thing you can get, which is some, something sensible, is if you optimize for both these things. And, and here is also a plot where after some time we compare, if you want the black and the blue lines, of how, what the mean squared error would look like uh, in your estimation of, of the pollutant uh, or the kind of uh, environmental quantity if you used with the black line here, the online gradients, and if you actually had access to the true uh, theta star and non star in this case study. So you see there's not much lost here. And, and this is um, good news. There is of course some time that you need this thing to converge and this is what this plot is. All right, and then an illustration to show. So, so if this was the concentration of your, your pollutant, and this was, if you want the true hidden signal that used to generate the observation, this synthetic data case study, this is what you would typically get if you know you do both parameter estimation and sensor uh, placement. This is what you would get if you did parameter estimation, but with not the best sensor placement. 
And this is what you would do without neither have done so. So just is a kind of illustration to show that this thing is useful to do both in practice. All right, so 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 I'm I'm reaching towards the end. Um, these are the the papers that uh, somehow this talk is is based on. I think this is useful, and we, we saw that somehow this is something that you can implement in in practice. We did it for linear Gaussian models, and somehow we even had a case where we had the stochastic PD for the signal, and we saw that this worked quite well, and. Uh, we, we tried different scenarios and, and added more sensors, added different things, and every time there was some tuning to tune the step sizes, but this was the main uh, issue. So if someone is familiar with implementing Kalman filters and tangents or gradients of, of Kalman filters online, that would be uh, all what is needed. Uh, so, so what happens now for, for nonlinear, non-Gaussian state space model? Uh, our view is that the ENKF is possible to use these methods uh, as long as the, the, the everything is 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 stable, the, the model, the, the filter, and the tangents. Uh, now, for nonlinear state space models, you could implement this thing using particle filters, and, and there have been at least for the parameter estimations implementation is this at least in discrete time. Now, to get any theoretical results from this, um, at least in continuous times, a little bit challenging. You could deal with the resampling by some recent work that tries to look at these Poisson controls with jump equations. So, so this is an optimistic, but the difficulty there would be to, to try to establish somehow the stability of both the actual particle filter and its gradients with respect to the parameters and the observers. So, so in the way we understand it, this could be a fairly tedious, but not impossible task. And I think this is where I would like to, to finish. And thanks a lot for, for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, for your talk. And do we have any questions from the audience? Alex, maybe we'll just wait for the, just hold on a minute, we're getting the microphone. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, can you please say about a little bit more about your likelihood function? Did you have problem to compute uh, minimum or maximum of it? Maybe derivative that exists gradient, or maybe Hessian, or maybe you need too many iterations, or many, or maybe too many points fulfill your threshold condition because it's five, it's seven dimensional optimization problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, there are seven variables here. So you're talking about the example, right? This is the question you're asking for, for let's say, for this example, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so, so just to, to understand the question, so so you have here a lot of... So, so we don't use any Cassian information in this. This is only first order. Um, so let me show just the... Let me go back to, to show the equation, perhaps, of the... Let me sorry. Let me go. Sorry for the sign flicking. Just to say something about the dynamics, right? So, so I mean, this is the main equation you would need to to propagate. So, let's say for for the Kalman filter, all right? Uh, you would have to propagate something like this. So, the main thing is to take this gradient and in the background, what I'm not showing, but I, I think we have it in the supplementary materials or, or one of the papers as well, is how to propagate these gradients. So there's an, an extra recursive form that you can actually propagate this gradient like as you go along the path. But we don't use any Hessian information here. And in fact, if you had any, that would be great, right? It would improve things uh, much more. Now, the catch here is that there are, as you said, many thetas and many O's. They are treated as one. So, so it's a bit tricky to, to find a good step sizes, but with a little bit of experience in the tuning, then this is, if you want, uh, possibly. Uh, but you, you don't actually calculate. This is the whole point of the scheme. You don't actually calculate the objective uh, of this. That you, what we're trying to do in 
in the theories to say what the actual objective is. So, so perhaps let me go a little bit back here. So we have this objective, which is the long uh, runtime average that I cannot calculate. I use another evolution. And what I'm trying to say is that basically this evolution will do the same job, right? And, and, and somehow, but to do this, I need some sort of stability for the gradients and, and uh, uh, the online gradients of the filter and things like that. Does this make sense? Does this cover you or? And for the iterations, Okay, maybe this is another one that you asked, which is more numerical. Now, okay, so when you tune these step sizes, depending on how aggressive you are, you can get faster or, or, or slower convergence here. Okay, this is a, a tuning exercise that is not pleasant, and I was very happy that Lewis was doing it. So, yes. But yeah, I mean, we haven't tried any of them. Uh, automatic uh, step size choosing uh, ideas. We just did it manually and it, 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 was, uh, it wasn't so difficult. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Raul, please. Thank you. thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. One I think is related to the previous one. I was asking whether it is possible to precondition the evolution of uh, the dynamics for theta and O uh, to see if you could actually react quicker to, to to changes. And and that was the first. And the second is is when you you show this this example where you move the theta right and and uh, and the 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 thing essentially adapts and changes the regime to to catch the new value, right? Uh, Implicitly in these assumptions of ergodicity that you have, aren't you assuming that somehow the system is faster somehow than 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 the changes and the changes are kind of slow? So somehow it is a quasi quasi ergodicity somehow that you are using, right? That you are able to actually get these averages to converge to the value and then it will move so slowly that things will more or less keep keep uh, moving these uh, ergodic averages around the the correct values. Is it? So, so, so that's the second bit, because I think you are correct, and it's easier to answer because this part is not covered by the theory, right? This is yeah, it's not. simply that's exactly what you're saying. There is a transition, and suddenly you change the ergodic distribution, and you move towards the new one, and, and somehow you get there, so, so everything mixes quick enough, exactly as you said it, so that I have two different ergodic uh, regimes that I patched up here. This is all it is. It, 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 your, your explanation was correct. And you know, the intuition is uh, the same as mine. It's just that this is not covered directly by the uh, theory. Of course, it's is... not covered in the theory. That's why I yeah, asked. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it's just something that somehow I th my, this is a personal kind of uh, uh, thing I like about these methods. They have step size. They are a little bit, if you want, uh, you need to be used to you working with uh, stochastic gradients to, to, to be comfortable with them. But yeah, you get this extra for free. If there are change points, you, you might detect them. And I, I think this is something that has not been, if you want, um, widely advertised. So, so this is why I included. But there's, we, we don't have any maths for this, right? So it's, uh, Okay. And, and I, for the first question, you you asked you you asked something about yeah yeah, yeah I mean, right? you, you said that you were order, you were using first order information right Gra gradient yeah. stochastic yeah. gradient computations and and I was asking whether one could use some kind of you know okay, when you so, have so, gradients so. somehow and you collect them over some time you okay, have implicitly uh, some second order information so can, I was you, asking whether you could use that uh, in some you way you can you, you can right and uh, I will be completely honest with you and apologies to, to the, the previous person that asked because I forgot to to, to answer this so so okay to, to to bring a little bit of more backgrounds and stuff so, so somehow long long time ago right we were looking at recursive likelihood recursive maximum likelihood methods in discrete time for a long time uh, when we're working with particle filtering. So this could be more than 10, 15 years ago, right? Maybe more than 10 years ago. So, so we had some experience on how to do this. And at that time, there were people, and there was a paper by Poyadzis, uh, Doucet, and Singh that actually, or, or some more material in Poyadzis thesis that had also how to work with the second order information and propagate also Hessians in time. Uh, so, so this is possible, and people have done it also with particle filtering, but I, I can tell you it's extremely tedious, 
And in the examples I have, I had seen at the time, right? Which and when I was a, still a PhD student, so, so maybe I didn't see it as thoroughly as I should at the time, right? Uh, somehow I didn't see much value compared to the extra labor. But of course, this was very dependent on the examples we saw, and ever, whatever I'm talking about is for discrete time state space models and particle filters in implementing this method. So you can do it, but the, the propagation of the Hessian brings so much complexity that you need to deal with and tune and be very careful with, at least for particle systems, that you, you know discouraged uh, me from following this up in this setup. Now, here everything is analytical, so it could be that I'm wrong and there's a lot of value to do it, but be prepared that this is possible, but it would be more tedious and you would need to do the same thing and have stability also for the second derivatives and the Hessians. But if you have that, it could be that you get much faster conversions and much better algorithms, no doubt about this. It's Thank just you. that I, I don't have an honest answer whether it is worth your time but it will depend no, on it's how enough. hard your it's problem enough. is. Yeah, yeah. So, so. If I stop, I will. Yeah, Ragallo. Okay, so I think we're, we're at time now. So let's thank Nicholas again. Thank you so much. Thanks. Stop sharing.